Hello. The term in vivo means in life or in a living creature, usually used in language as in vivo therapy. In people, that would be more commonly referred to as exposure therapy. In life exposure therapy. For people with anxiety and specifically people with certain triggers, like say, hydrophobia, nyctophobia, claustrophobia, by being exposed to these issues in at least small amounts of time at a time, it can be treated. It's slow, and it's scary, and it's hard, but it's possible. So if one were to be lost in vivo, well, that would be someone lost in life, lost within your own fears, stuck with something you are absolutely terrified of, lost inside of a living creature, writhing, angry. Your fears have created this hell because of you. You are the virus, and it wants you out. Lost in Vivo is a 2018 psychological indie horror game developed by Kira, an indie horror dev on the scene. While I don't know much about Kira or other, the f other than the fact that they've made me shiver with their games on multiple occasions, including their segments in the Dread X collections, Kira is a very interesting dev, creating some of the most disturbing and scary indie horror I've seen since In the psychology of the modern civilized human being, it is difficult to overstate the significance of the house. Creeping up my spine and digging into the base of my back, I love the style that Kira creates in their games. It's slimy and cold. It may look fine on the surface, but deep underneath all that niceness there is a filth. That filth is gross pus and slime, gore waiting for you underneath the pleasant normalities. Take for instance their short game from the Hunt Dread X Collection. It's a simple little game about going out hunting, taking some pictures of whatever you're able to catch. Very simple. You play as this little funny man saying Powder. and stuff. It's stupid, but I love it. But slowly, over time, things become wrong. Animals are fused together. Animals are found skinned and placed into abandoned RVs in trees. A giant moose seems to be infected by something. It's, it's all wrong. All of this happens with no acknowledgement from your character either. You'll read a note like this. There's almost no food left. I feel myself slipping away. I will not succumb to the call of the wood. I will resist. And then just move on casually. Later you find yourself in a darker forest. The, this part actually gets me pretty good. Some Blair Witch shit. Just the fear of the woods. What could be out there doing this? I won't spoil the ending for anyone that wants to play this little game as it's really good, but I did want to highlight Kira's style as we move towards the nightmare that is Lost in Vivo. Lost in Vivo is about claustrophobia, if you couldn't tell by all the enclosed dark spaces in the game. The music that almost drills directly into your skull in a means to completely disable you emotionally. This opening alone that I use footage from terrified me on a level that I'd never seen since the original PT. It really fucked me up. I had to take a year break similar to Outer Wilds just because I'm a little baby. I'm a little, I'm scared of some sewers. But seriously, these games are terrifying, horrifying. This one in particular uses much more interesting tactics than any other horror game I've played of late. It's very similar to Silent Hill, of course, as you could probably tell by the music and the sounds and the visual style, but more gross, ripped and torn into the state of being it's in now, like the game itself doesn't want to exist. But it's all worth it. 
because this game has one of the best ways to drive a player in a video game. The entire point of Lost in Vivo is this fucking dog, funny corgi named Danny. Danny is actually a really great therapy dog. You can tell she is one because of the nice little vest she wears around her back. This dog is actually a genius game design choice. You heard me right. Dog in a video game, 10 out of 10. That's simple, I don't make the rules. But really, this dog is actually great. The game starts with you walking this doggo down the street on a sunny day. It's beautiful outside. You can find missing posters on the walls, but it's fine, it's fine. It starts raining. The rain is cold. The concrete starts to make me sick. I keep going on. The rain starts to get violent and close in around me. Suddenly, a flash flood hits before I can even realize what's going on. Danny is swept up by the current and pulled into a nearby storm drain. Naturally, you go in after her. This is where the remainder of Lost in Vivo takes place. Sewers, train stations, old mines. This game's horror works because of locations like this. Closed in, dark, buried underground, unnaturally lit. You can whistle for your dog and usually get a distant bark in response. This is actually one of the best motivators for exploring horror that I've ever seen in a horror game. A big problem with most horror games is that motive for exploring the horror. Outlast, for instance, does this well. First, you're there to find out what's going on at the Mount Massive Asylum after receiving a mysterious email. Then, after shit hits the fan, you just gotta get the fuck out of there. Of course, it gets more complex as things go on, but it always stays grounded in that. Escape. A bad horror game would give you a big stupid objective and absolutely no reason to go for it. For instance, Outlast 2. Now, I like this game at some points, but oh my god. Nobody cares about Lynn. I don't think a single person gave a shit when she died in the third act, and it, that's just it's just like Okay. You could say your goal is to escape, but you spend most of the entire game getting to your fucking wife instead of just running into the woods. I think Blake would rather be playing The Forest than fucking Outlast 2 of all things. I still like Outlast 2 though. I think the aesthetics are excellent, I think that the area design is really cool, the game engine's really good, the animations are really good, music, stealth, mechanics are actually really good for some reason, and if it was a better game it would have been way cooler. But it still suffers overall because of some weird story choices, strange and closed level design despite the outdoor setting, and overall not enough meat to actually back up the mystery that they set up early in the game. Unless you read the comics, but most people didn't. Those are great by the way, you should actually go read them, link in the description. But at the same time, the story is really interesting and has a lot of themes and sequences that I actually really like because of those weird choices. It just never really adds up to anything substantial, which is the real problem here. It's almost like it's missing the ending the first game has, where you fall into the basement of the horrible secret lab and discover all of the awful secrets and then die. I will say more nice things about Outlast 2 though, because I actually do like it, and I think it has some things that are actually really, really good. I love the way this blood rain looks in this scene, the transitions between the school and temple gate are actually fantastic and really cool, and oh Jesus man, the sound design and the soundtrack by Samuel LaFlame who did the first game soundtrack. I'm lost and hurt. There is good here. I'm just using some of its mistakes for comparison and explaining how Vivo does it better. I actually extended this part a little just because I wanted to talk about Outlast 2 more. <laughs> Lost in Vivo fixes this very simple issue by replacing a character with no personality with a cute dog. What character is there to tell here? Good girl, yes, yes, good dog, dog good. You don't need to explain to a player why a dog is good. Just look, dog equals good, it's basic psychology. You can whistle to find dog, go to dog sounds. Very simple. No HUD or yellow fucking text and Blake saying, oh God, oh no shit, oh God, I gotta find Lynn. Continuing down into the sewer, you can find lots of graffiti and fun stuff on the walls here. A lot of patron people and Kickstarter backers, all sorts of things. There's also a little reference to I'm Scared right here, which I have yet to beat, but I'm working on it. 
as well as just the atmosphere down here being absolutely dripping. This game knows how to scare you. Not just by jumping in your face and screaming, but by making you genuinely afraid of what could be, as well as not allowing you to fully understand what actually is. The first encounter establishes this perfectly. You step into a hallway after running along for a while looking for your dogs. Her bark has stopped. You have a hammer now. Entering the room, you can see a creepy mural of an eyeless man on the wall. Before you can even get a good look at it, this happens. From this point on, the game never lets up, sending you into room after room of increasingly horrible things. One room is lined with seemingly empty cages, although too dark to know if they're empty for sure. In this room, the game just turns off your flashlight in the dark and plays a scary creature sound behind you. For just a second, you're in complete darkness against your own will. The batteries on the flashlight never run out, they only pull this trick once. It's entirely to show you how unpredictable this game's horror can be. It's off-putting, meta even, haunted. This feeling is greatly improved by the oddly off-putting PS2-style graphics. Textures are hard to make out and strange-looking. Models have just enough detail to be frightening, but not enough for you to actually understand what you're looking at. Perfectly uncanny. I think the dog is actually the best-looking model in the game on purpose. Danny looks like a traditional corgi. She's very normal and good, 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 good dog, good dog. But the nightmare tunnel continues. With horrible creatures in cages, the song playing also gives me this awful sense of paranoia. Like I'm being chased, but I couldn't know what it is until it catches me. Also, the soundtrack in this game, holy shit. It's terrifying, it's fun, it's beautiful. There's so many unique tracks that when I looked at the full list on Spotify, I was very impressed with how much of the music is made for just one area and then that's it. It's a very Silent Hill sounding game, but it wears those influences on its sleeve with its strange monsters, self-destructive themes, weird graphical style and characters. It's perfect. This game scared the absolute shit out of me with some of its, its themes and styles. And a lot of that is thanks to the three folks who did the various tracks for the soundtrack. Jaron Christ, Nolan Reese, and Akuma Kira themselves. Also, I gotta say, I love some of Kira's track names. I mean, Forbidden Tuna, Rat People, A Bag of Static, Clicky Gurgles, Brain Melt, Crazy Ghost Theme, Horton Hears a Ghost in the Horton Mine, The Man Who Stole Several Leopards, what the fuck is this, Kira? But I really love all the various charms all these wonderful people bring to this soundtrack. Lost in Vivo's soundtrack is excellent, top of its class. It works its way into your brain using strings, drums, unnatural electronic beats, guitar strums, piano, scratching and scraping sounds as well as many other strange-sounding otherworldly things that I literally don't know how to explain other than... Uh, what's the name of this track? Oh yeah, Screaming Worms. This sentiment with the music is further reflected in the safe room, which is actually more of a Resident Evil thing than a Silent Hill thing, the way it's executed here, but it borrows it in a great way. I love this safe room. It's very chill. What I love more about it is how the game compromises that safety sometimes. Like here, where after saving with a very Silent Hill red splash screen where usually the game says, game saved, instead, it says, save deleted, refusing to further elaborate. The first time I played this, I was angry, scared. 
I tried to leave, but the game spawns an unkillable Shuggoth down the hall, too, so you have to die here. You get the game over screen, and you're even totally booted back to the menu. If you hit continue, it starts back at the opening cutscene of the game. It really tries to make you think that it actually deleted your save data. Also, just something that I'm noticing in editing here, the text that is seen on screen during this section is actually context for the next section, which is all about bulimia, which is a really cool transition to such an area. Just thought that was cool. But in the end, the game was just doing a bit of trolling. There was also the classic funny joke, replacing your save button with a screaming fetus when you try to save. Oh, wow. Oh, great. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the nightmares. I didn't need them, but they... A personal favorite part of the game for me is a section in the late game. You've been through hell, seen monsters worse than anything I've ever seen in games, been torn away at, shooting in the dark, surviving off of scraps, and being almost eaten by trains? I swear this game has no chill. You finally end up in the mines. It sucks here. Left for dead by everything. All you can do is pray that your dog is still alive. You're in the mines now. It's not even slightly comforting like the subway. It's just unfamiliar caves and tunnels as far as the eye can see. Darkness. These tunnels wait for no one. Not anymore. In the distance, though, after walking for a while, you can see her. I it's Danny. She's... I don't think there was a single person on Earth that bought that, but that's still just as scary to me. It didn't just imitate my dog, it did it poorly. It didn't just pretend to be my dog and kill me, it crudely, horribly misrepresented my dog. That's why it scares me. In reality, it's a horrible monster, using something you love to distract you, then gobbling you up. Speaking of, this game's enemies are so great. You've got the eyeless fucks, these weird guys, uh, this, that, uh, this mirror guy, I guess. And then finally, the mother of all shitheads. We all hate him. We all need him. Your brain. What are you hoping to accomplish? Without me, you're just hollow. You're pathetic. You need fear to motivate you. I'm your identity. I'm your crutch. You used to cling to me like a parasite. I know you better than anyone, and I know you're weak. You'll come right back. Maybe you should like and subscribe, huh? Wow. Um, I, I fucking hate this guy. Overall, Lost in Vivo is probably one of my favorite horror games of all time. It really scared me for one, but it made me laugh, it made me jump with fright, but more than that, it was a journey. As one of the messages you see on the wall implies here, you are entering into hell. Anyone able to return alive and sane is very brave. This creature we trod through to find our measly dog rejects us at every turn. Not even the sewers. The game itself is alive. It wants you out. It tires as you try to escape it, and eventually, you can find a moment to escape. But, Danny, you have a choice here. Leave your dog, or face the horrors one last time that lie below. It's your choice, just don't get lost down there. Sometimes, it can feel like your own fears are eating you alive, tearing your flesh from your bones, slowly and painfully consuming your rotting corpse. Then the leeches come, They'll wriggle into your eye sockets and become the eyes you sorely lack. You can't see. You can't even see how dead you are if you stay here. You're dead. Leave while you still can. So, what'll it be? I'm getting my dog back. No matter what.